As the Germans got closer to Russia, the desperate Soviet Air Force top officials finally admitted they needed help from the nation's most famous aircraft designer, Andrei Tupolev. As with many Russian engineers and scientists of the era, the problem was that Tupolev was in prison for crimes against the Red State. Designed from a prison cell, the twin-engine dive bomber was a machine unlike any other, with many combinations of armament and weaponry depending on the mission. Intrinsically built as a high-speed daylight and frontline bomber, the Tu-2 was so versatile that it contributed to various missions, including air-to-air -air combat, interception, ground attack, close air support, and ISR, or intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Introduced right in the middle of World War II, the Tu-2 quickly became one of the most successful warplanes of the era, an essential part of the Red Army's fight against the once invincible Third Reich, and ultimately, a forgotten icon of the Soviet Air Force. Jailbird Only months into World War II, the Soviet Air Force's fighter warplane arsenal was already obsolete when compared to the modern mighty beasts of the Luftwaffe. As such, the service became interested in developing a medium-sized bomber platform, complete with a large internal bomb load and similar speeds to a single-seat fighter. To achieve this, the top officials turned to legendary aviation engineer Andrei Tupolev, who had been in jail for over a year. The engineer, who founded the Tupolev Design Bureau in 1922, was arrested by the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs, or NKVD, along with thousands of scientists on charges against the Red State. The prisoners were forced to do grueling hard labor, but luckily for Tupolev, the infamous Lavrent Liberia, Stalin's Commissar for Internal Affairs and Chief of the NKVD, set up a special prison camp in Moscow, otherwise known as a Sharashka, where he sent a large team of the country's most excellent aircraft designers. Beria then summoned Tupolev to lead a team to design a versatile four-engine dive bomber, but before accepting the general's forceful request, Tupolev confronted Beria and convinced him that a high-speed twin-engine dive bomber would be a better fit for the seemingly inevitable war. Working under constant scrutiny and never-ending pressure from both the prison's guards and the political situation, the designers were not even allowed to sign their own sketches. Still, by mid-1938, the team led by Tupolev had created the Soviet's most significant bomber of World War II, the Tu-2. Tupolev Tu-2 an all-metal mid-wing monoplane powered by two 1,400-horsepower water-cooled McCoolin AM-37 V-12 engines, the prototype, known as ANT-58, took to the skies for the first time on January 29, 1941, flown by Mikhail Nukhtinov. Then, after adjusting a few minor problems, the second prototype, with a larger cockpit and a new tail turret, went aloft on May 18, 1941. While this model was the first to enter production, only 19 rolled out, before the production plant switched to the much-needed Yakovlev Yak-1 fighters to fight the Germans already invading Russia. In the meantime, Tupolev decided to further revise the design for mass production. This fine-tuning led to the first Tu-2 version. After a series of tests and more changes, the first three bomber models were sent to a military Air Force bomber unit for training in the fall of 1942. The Tu-2 had a top speed of 380 miles per hour, a range of up to 1,250 miles, a service ceiling of almost 30,000 feet, and a rate of climb of 1,600 feet per minute. The twin-engine Soviet daylight and frontline bomber aircraft would be a solid asset for any air force, as they offered the performance and speed of dedicated fighters with the same firepower of larger bombers in one single package. With a standard crew consisting of a pilot in the front cockpit, a navigator right behind him, a gunner, and a radio operator in the rear cockpit right behind the wing, the number and positions could be altered depending on the mission. A true multi-role aircraft, the type was produced in torpedo, interceptor, and reconnaissance versions, and could be outfitted with various mix-and-match armament layouts, including machine guns, cannons, bombs, and torpedoes, depending on the sortie. So extensive was the success of the Tupolev Tu-2 that the engineer and his entire team were released from prison, and the former received the famed Stalin USSR Prize for his contribution. Introduction to Service 
designed to challenge the German Junkers Ju-88. The first machines went into combat in the spring of 1942 and were an immediate triumph for the struggling Soviet Air Force fighting against the feared Luftwaffe. As the Germans invaded the Soviet Union in June of 1942 to open up the Eastern Front, it forced the Soviet industry to set up entire production lines in central Russia, building many weapons and warplanes in short order to supply the Red Army. Amongst the manufactured defense products was the Tu-2. During the fall of 1942, the frontline bomber had its baptism of fire over Vilikyaluki, a town occupied by German troops, flying over 46 sorties in two months. The Tu-2 soon became the USSR's second most crucial twin-engine bomber, just behind the Pe-2. Circling the Germans The Soviet pilots noticed the aircraft could survive heavy damage before giving out, and the type was also quite resilient to the harsh Russian winters. Such capabilities made them highly valuable to the combined Soviet operations, requiring air support regardless of the weather conditions. The Tu-2 participated in Operation Uranus in November of 1942, the codename for the Russian Army's series of strategic operations on the Eastern Front. Led by General Georgi Zhukov, the counterattack against the German 6th Army involved over half a million troops, 900 tanks, and almost 1,500 aircraft. Within three days, the Russians had encircled the Axis forces in the outskirts of Stalingrad, and while the besieged Italian and Romanian troops soon surrendered, the Germans held on, depending on airlifted supplies to survive the vicious Russian winter. By mid-January of 1943, the Soviets launched an assault on the last German-held airport, completely severing their vital supply lines. With no choice but to surrender, Germany finally gave in and effectively turned the tide of the war on the Eastern Front the road to Berlin was finally open. The following month, the Tu-2 bomber flew another 47 sorties, dropping ordnance on airfields and rail junctions until April. By the summer of 1943, only three Tu-2s had been lost in action. Despite maintenance issues due to the warplane's intricacies and overall complexity, flight crews from different units of the Soviet Air Force clamored for more models, as the type's performance, armament, and bomb capacity were unmatched. End of the war. The enthusiasm to continue manufacturing the outstanding aircraft led the Russian government to reopen a previously closed factory in Omsk with Tu-2 production lines. Meanwhile, Andrei Tupolev kept revising his bomber's design and created a simplified version of the model. It was named Tu-2S, and it first flew on August 26, 1943. The model became the definitive version of the Tu-2 and had two 1,850-horsepower fuel-injected ASH-82FN engines, giving it a top speed of 352 miles per hour. The fighter was so valued by Soviet airmen that it was used in all major battles towards the end of the war and was a pivotal contributor to the Red Army's victory over the Germans. As Nazi Germany's resistance stiffened at the eastern borders by late 1944, TU bomber units neutralized many heavily defended German cities, including Kustrin and Königsberg. Then, during the final months of the global conflict, the TU-2 bomber fought in the last battle for Berlin, engaging with Japanese aircraft and fighting against Kwantung army forces in Manchuria, China. By the time the hostilities ended in Europe on May 8, 1945, a total of 1,111 TU-2 bombers had been delivered to the Russian Air Force with a remarkable loss rate of only one aircraft for every 46.5 sorties, the Tu-2 became known as the best Soviet bomber of the war. A legend. The Tu-2 remained Russia's frontline aircraft after the war, undergoing a series of continuous updates that kept it competitive. Another 1,416 models were built up to 1948. Besides its successful role in combat operations, the Tu-2 continued to prove its flexibility by performing as a test aircraft for different power plants. It was also the airframe that housed the first Russian-made jet engines. Tupolev's outstanding Tu-2 remained in service in the VVS, the bombing group that used the aircraft the most until 1955. During the Cold War, both the United States and the Soviet Union went to great lengths to supply their own allies with military equipment. As such, Export Tu-2 served in the air forces of North Korea, Poland, Romania, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and other nations. 
Some surplus Tu-2s were provided to the Chinese People's Liberation Army Air Force for use in the Chinese Civil War, serving as ground attack, reconnaissance, and liaison aircraft. The Tu-2s used by the People's Liberation Army Air Force weren't retired until the late 1970s, and some continued to perform frontline operational duties into the 1980s. With a long and dutiful history that spanned many decades, the highly regarded Tu-2 aircraft was one of only a few World War II warplanes that served long enough after the conflict to receive the NATO codename Bat-1. Thank you for watching our Dark Skies video. Don't forget to hit the bell icon to be the first to know about our new content. And for more historical and military videos, make sure to check out all our other Dark Documentaries channels. Stay tuned for more.